In Revelation 14, beginning in verse 1, John says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder, and I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps, and they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile or falsehood, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give, him, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his right hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast, his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles, for 1,600 furlongs. Please pray with me. Well, Father, what an amazing God you are. What an amazing plan you have. What an amazing infinite, inf infinite eternal reality exists. And when we get a moment to pause and look up to the nightly sky or even to a beautiful cloud-filled day and to realize 
It goes on forever. And this planet is being held in space as are the billions and billions of galaxies, the trillions of stars, each one having a name known by you, all of that spanning the span of your hand, as it were, to show us how great and almighty you are. And what is man that thou art mindful of him? and that you are mindful of each one of us tonight as we gather here as a, a congregation, opening your precious word, asking, Lord, that you would feed us and that the word of God tonight would not be merely the accumulation of information, but in addition to that, it would be information that helps to transform our lives to mold us more and more, to conform us more and more into the image of Christ and to put within us a soberness and a love and a concern and a compelling to live for you and to be a bright light in this dark, needy, painful, sin-sick world headed for the great judgment of God. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, this chapter has been said by some to be kind of like a table of contents right in the middle of Revelation, kind of showing us what's going to happen uh, the rest of the way through the rest of the book. So that helps us to understand the different events uh, that are going to be happening through the rest of the book of Revelation. So with that in mind, uh, it should assist you a little bit. He begins now to talk about the 144,000. And there's a number of announcements that are made in this chapter. The first one is concerning the 144,000 whom we were introduced to earlier in the book of Revelation, back in the, in the seventh chapter, 12,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes. John is saying, then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion. Now to a Jew, a lamb would be something that immediately brings them back to the worship in the temple where lambs were slain, especially on the Day of Atonement and at other times. So to them a lamb had the idea of God's holiness, man's sin, and the shedding of blood which covered the sin of man. So for a Jew of that day, uh, that's immediately what we would think. Now when we think of a lamb here, we think of, oh yeah, sweet little lamb, and Jesus is the lamb, and we think of that kind of soft character, and rightly so. But John calls him a lamb, standing on Mount Zion. And so this is um, kind of futuristic. Mount Zion is another name for the city of Jerusalem where during the millennial period before the great white throne judgment, Jesus will reign from Jerusalem over all of the earth. So he's looking forward, seeing Christ there in Jerusalem, and with him... 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. Now, a couple of things. First of all, it says they are with him. Secondly, it numbers them, same number that they started with. And thirdly, it says they have their father's name written on their forehead. One of the things about Jesus Christ and his people, he is with them, even as he is with you. In fact, Jesus in the gospel said, uh, he spoke about, you know, if you and I will look to him, if you and I will open our hearts to him, he and the father will come and they will make their abode within our lives. Now, of course, Christ is with us, but he's speaking of the desire of God to be more and more a part of our lives, and he's enunciating the reality that you and I need to be vessels for whom he's able to come 
and to dwell in. And we'll talk a little bit more about the importance of being a vessel, a clean vessel that is appropriate, appropriate for the Lord to live in. Secondly, he started with 144,000 and he indicated back in the seventh chapter that these people were not going to, he was going to preserve them. Nothing could kill them. And so what, what he said has come to pass and of those whom the Lord gave him, he didn't lose a one. And it's the same thing with you and I. Jesus said, of all that you've given me, I haven't lost a one. He's a good shepherd. And Christ finishes the work that he starts with us. And then having his father's name written on their forehead. So if you're not into tattoos, too bad because... You're going to see a lot of them in heaven, but we don't quite know exactly how, you know, it seems weird to us to have a name on the forehead, but it, it has to do really with identification as belonging to God. You and I have an identification right now that identifies us as belonging to God. It's found in Ephesians chapter 1, where upon our coming to Christ, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. That seal, that presence of the Holy Spirit within us is a mark of ownership by the Lord. The Lord knows them that are his. And so you have that mark of ownership. Verse 2, and I heard a voice from heaven after seeing the Lamb. He noticed, he says, like, and again, John, it's worth repeating every time we see it, but John is trying to describe something he had never seen. You and I, you know, most things that we might see, other people have either seen it or they've seen something like it. There's very few things we see that no one else has ever seen or we couldn't show a picture. But he had never seen this. He'd never heard these things. So he said, and I heard a voice from heaven and, and he notes here the place called heaven. We forget there is an actual place. It's in a location. It's a spiritual reality. It's called heaven. He said, I heard a voice from heaven, and it was like the voice of many waters. I was just in the uh, Southern California by the ocean last week, uh, going to bed listening to the waves lapping up on the shore. There were hardly mighty waters, but if you've ever been near a waterfall, the power of water. So he said, the voice was like the voice of many waters, like the voice of loud thunder. I mean, imagine how loud that would be. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. The music must have been absolutely beautiful. And let me pause here and say this. You know, a lot of Christians have the idea that heaven is going to be a real boring place. We get the picture of uh, sitting around, you know, on a cloud, angels playing a harp. And of course, that, that sounds boring to us. And here's one of the little verses that's helped produce that sense of boredom looking towards heaven. And I can, I can tell you this, that as you begin to study about what heaven is really going to be like, it includes a, this earth is going to be destroyed, a resurrected earth is going to be created, the resurrected bodies of all the saints are going to be on it, a place called heaven, a new city is going to come and either rest on the earth or in close proximity to it. People will be going from the earth to heaven and we will be serving the Lord for eternity. Now, serving the Lord for eternity without, of all, without all of the encumbrances, no problems, no tiredness, no difficulties, and so we're going to have an eternal purpose. Our lives will be much like they are now. We'll know one another perfectly. We'll identify one another. We'll know every person who's in heaven. 
and we will have a joyous eternal life and the colors and the music and the 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 beauty of the lord no sun no moon god is the light thereof and so um, here john is saying and i heard the sound of harpists playing their harps well believe me that alone wouldn't be boring to hear harp music the lyre being played from heaven and they sang being the 144,000 they sang as it were a new song before the throne before the four living creatures and the elders and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth now um Nobody's going to know that song except these people. Why? Well, because of the uniqueness of who they are, what they've gone through. Nobody else has been through all of that. And do you know that with all of the difficulties that you go through in your life, God is teaching you the music of heaven, and he is preparing your life to be able to sing a song in heaven that nobody else can sing. And so if you look at the difficulties that come into your life as being allowed by God, and if you cooperate with God, as it says in James, um, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the trying of your faith produces patience, but let and L-E-T, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, that you may be full grown. You know, you see a little puppy, big head, big paws, cute, but, you know, but when they're full grown, they're, everything is proportional. You and I are being grown into being well-rounded, and I don't mean this way. You know, I have to tell you a cute little story. I used to travel to Japan a lot. I mean, I, I traveled, there was a period where I traveled so frequently, I knew the flight attendants by name, and I'd say, oh, you're working this week. And say, oh, yeah, hi, Pastor Bob. And then I, I met so many Japanese people there, uh, more, and I couldn't remember them all. I mean, I met so many, I just couldn't remember them all. And one night, we were at this pastor's home on the second floor, at a big long table and he had about eight sons and they were all pastors and he was the big you know kahuna of that whole operation and uh we hadn't been there for a while but one of the pastors uh the sons he said to me as we we're eating he said oh he said i remember you he says but you bigger now <laughs> and i said well thank you so much and he never got it, you know. <laughs> oh, goodness. I don't even know. Well-rounded, thank you. Yeah, well-rounded. I was well-rounded, believe me. And he, he let me know it. <laughs> but it's true. When you go through something, most people have never been quite through what you've been through. For example, we have people here who've suffered incarceration. Most people here have never suffered that. We have law enforcement officers here who've spent a career providing safety and experiencing things that have affected their lives of we have no idea. And so these people can sing songs that you and I don't know. And the troubles that you have are someday going to be turned into a song of praise. And the rest of us will sit back and say, wow, what a, what a beautiful song. Because the song will be filled with praise to God. I tell people all the time, I had a guy ask me today, he said, you know, I just read your ma the magazine, and wow, and wow, 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 you know, I didn't know, and I said, oh, yeah, yeah. And I said, you know, I wouldn't trade what we went through for all the money in the world. He said, man, 
He said, that's quite a testimony. And I said, it's true. That's a song. I can sing that song. And so these people are going to sing a song of all the ministry that they've had in the tribulation period, which Jesus said there's never been anything like it. And they're going to have been faithful evangelists proclaiming the good news being preserved by God. And it says in verse 4, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now, we don't know if it means literally or it's speaking spiritually of their purity. These are the ones who follow the Lamb. So we can say, number one, they're not defiled. They've remained pure. Number two, they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits of God to man. And that last statement helps you to realize this is indeed a table of contents showing these are some of the first ones that are going to go up to heaven. First fruits always means this is, is an example of the many that are going to come afterwards. Many are coming. This is the first group right here that's being taken up during the tribulation period into the presence of heaven. But how true it is that a pure life and an obedient life help us to be prepared to be used by the Lord. If you'll turn with me, please, to 2 Timothy, there's a, uh, a scripture where Paul actually elaborates on this particular concept. 2 Timothy um, Chapter three, chapter two, actually, um, beginning in verse nineteen, Second Timothy chapter two, verse nineteen, he says, "Nevertheless," and the nevertheless is in spite of what's said in verse seventeen and eighteen, verse sixteen through eighteen, which is worth reading. He's saying, "Timothy, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will." increase to more ungodliness and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenius and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth saying that the resurrection is already past and they are, they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands sure having this seal the Lord knows those who are his. And in every great building in that culture, they would have a, a big saying on the foundation. And the one on the foundation of God is this, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Just go away from it. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. For example, every house has the beautiful ch china ware that nobody ever touches. I mean, it's just there. You see it. It's shown by the wife to the visitors. And God forbid that the man would ever accidentally go in there and grab one of those cups. He will die an early death. Uh, but then there are also vessels of wood and clay. There's always a little can next to the, the toilet. Uh, two different things. Verse 21, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor. So there is a cleansing process that takes place in our life. And that cleansing process is when we cooperate with the conviction of God within our lives. We, and how sometimes it's a quick cleansing, it's a small item, we have no problem, you know, yes, Lord, and we go on. Other times, it, maybe it's a little slower. Maybe it's bitterness, anger, hatred, whatever. Uh, maybe it's some other personal sin. Maybe it's a besetting sin. And we don't always get over it so quickly. But, but, we, we, but he says here, if the man who cleanses himself from the latter will be a vessel for honor, sanctified or set apart, useful for the master's use, prepared for every good work, flee also 
youthful lusts. And you know, uh, youthful lusts are different than old person's lusts. They're, they're just, they're different. They're tremendously different. I, I think back of my youth and the people I knew and of the culture and of what we did, and I can't believe it. I can't believe how foolish, ignorant, deceived, blind, stupid, dangerous we were. And as you grow older, you get a better sense of how, and that's, you know, if you were not raised correctly, which I was not, I blame all of my trouble on my parents. I take no responsibility for it. But uh, nonetheless, he's pointing out here, if the power of youthful lusts happens to pop up, run away from it. Run away from it. And not only run away from that, but in, on the other side, pursue something. Pursue righteousness, doing things that are right, the right way. Not just believing what's right, but doing what's right. Pursue righteousness, faith, which is trusting in God, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And these things, by the way, don't just come naturally. They are, they are provided to us but we have to pursue them. We have to participate in them. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And you know, at my age, I don't have any time for it. The, it's just not profitable. And um, I can send you somewhere where you can find somebody to argue with you, you know. And, and unfortunately, so often in our, and I've been there, you just, you know, Christians sometimes are like high school students, early college age. And I'm, please don't be offended if you're, how do I get out of this? I don't think I can. There is the tendency in youthfulness to think that you're smarter than you are. Now, you may be intellectually brighter than other people, and you may be correct there, but it takes a while to get the life experience. And so, sometimes you think you're so smart at that age, and Christians often go through a growth period where they, they just think they're so smart and they want to argue everything with everybody, and it's just silly. It makes no, it's not beneficial. But back in Revelation 14, it's important to look at these qualities here because um, they were chaste. And we must be pure in ministry. One of the gross sins of the tribulation period will be apostasy or spiritual adultery, leaving God and worshiping the Antichrist. But these witnesses are undefiled by the world, having given themselves in pure devotion to the Lord. And that is something you and I can do right now today. Without your imagination going too far, I predict pretty soon you won't have to go on the adult channels to see naked women. It's going to be on primetime TV. I mean, the way these, these award shows, these music shows, they're like striptease shows, and every year there's less and less clothing, and they're getting away with everything they can, and pretty soon they're just going to say, just come on out in your, baby, you know, your birthday suit, and you'll be just fine. I mean, it, it, we're living in a horribly difficult world. So they were pure. They followed the Lamb. Notice, wherever he goes. You know, you and I do not write the script and then tell Jesus, Jesus, here's the story. Here's how we've got it all figured out. This is where we want you to go, and we'll follow you. It's not like that at all. 
He says, follow me. And a lot of times we go, what? You want me to go there, do this, be that? And he says, yeah, I absolutely do. I want you to share in the sufferings of Christ with me. He went through his own crucifixion. And you and I, a pastor once told me a number of years ago, he said, Bob, you are going through your crucifixion. And I thought, oh, that's the truth, man. That's exactly what is happening to me. We go through that. And you know what? There are more trials to come, more trials to come in all of our lives. Verse 5, and in their mouth was found no guile, no falsehood. They were honest, for they are without fault before the throne of God. What a picture. Now, concerning the everlasting gospel in the next couple of verses, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, which means it has been from before the beginning and will exist forever. He had the everlasting gospel. Think about it for a moment. As Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The something that is everlasting was before anything else. The gospel is before anything else. Peter says he was crucified as a lamb from before the foundations of the earth, the everlasting gospel. So in the midst of the tribulation period, in the judgment and the wrath of God is going to be the mercy of God trying to save people from ultimate destruction in the lake of fire. And he's doing, doing it through an angel flying around the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, and then notice, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So um, people have often, and the Bible says that he isn't going to come till the whole world has heard the gospel. Well, here you go, right there to every tribe, nation, tongue, and people. So he's going to speak their language wherever he goes, whatever little people group that is in some little island in the remote part of somewhere. Nobody's ever even been there. And this angel's going to visit them and pronounce the good news, the good news that there is a gift from God to people who don't deserve it. Because that God loves you. That God wants you to enjoy him and not be miserable here and miserable for all eternity in hell. The everlasting good news. And it's, I think we should try to consciously, when we think of the word gospel, in our own minds, go to the original meaning. It means good news. We have, oh, watch the news tonight on TV. Tell me, is there any good news? You go crazy after about 30 minutes. Arguments and nobody finishes. About the only guy that makes any sense is Tucker Carlson. If you've ever watched him, about a third of the way through anybody's interviewing, he says, you know, I'm confused because they're not making sense. He's operating off of some kind of plumb line, and he says, I'm confused. Now, I like watching him because he can think and think clearly, and he's got some type of, of you know, something that he adheres to that seems to be consistently truthful. You and I have good news. There's not any news better than the good news. The news that someone in your stead paid for your crime. Think of it this way on a much lower level. Think of all the debt that is represented in Visalia tonight. The bills that, don't think about it too much, i make you depressed. The bills that are owed, and what if somebody came into town and said, I'm paying everybody's bill off? We'd say, man, what good news that is. Well, that's not going to happen, by the way. It was just a moment of uh, imagination. But it's good news. Our debt would be paid. Christ 
paid our debt. It's gone. Our sins have been forgiven. We couldn't do it. Our sins have been paid for. He took them, paid for them, done. And so he's preaching that everlasting gospel. And in verse 7, it tells us what he's saying to the people, saying with a loud voice. He's not whispering it. It's not, you know, a little fireside chat saying with a loud voice these things, fear God, number one, give glory to him, number two, number three, the hour of his judgment has come, number four, and worship him, number five, who made heaven and earth and the sea and springs of water. So that's his message, fear God, which is the beginning of wisdom not the Antichrist, have respect for God and give glory to him or acknowledge who he is because the hour of his judgment has come. In other words, it's now or never. So God, even at the last moment, even as Jesus, knowing who betrayed him, broke bread with Judas gave him some of it, looked him dead in the eye, and he said, whatever you have to do, do it. But before he did that, he looked at him, gave him a moment. He could have changed his mind, I think. People can change their minds. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you can change your mind. You can fear God, and we better fear God. We can give glory. And you know, it gives glory to God by fearing him. The hour of his judgment is coming. He is the one and we're to worship him. And worship means not to come to church and sing songs. That's part of it. Worship means to prostrate yourself before God because of who he is. You know, before I was a Christian and I used to hear, I was, I was never, I was a Catholic, so I didn't know about Protestants much, but I would hear that they went to church on Sundays and then they went to church on Wednesdays as well. And I used to think, man, you're wasting a lot of your time. I mean, I can understand going once, but on Wednesday you go too? And then you give money to the people there? You could be having all this fun. You could be throwing up with me at 2 a.m. in the morning. I mean, what's the problem here? You know, you really don't understand it until God does something in your life and he saves you. Now, it's easy to lose that first love and kind of forget about him, but that can be revived, that can be renewed. And then we prostrate ourselves before him every day. We say, Lord, good morning. Hello, here I am. Let's go. I love you. Let me get into your one-year Bible, which you love more than any Bible in the whole world. Speak to me. Today I read about King David as he was old and ready to go to death. And he called a couple of his loyal men to him. And he started saying, now listen, there's some unfinished business here. And he started naming Joab and another guy, and he said, you need to go take care of that. And boy, a a whole number of people lost. There was one guy who knew he was going to die. He ran into the temple. He was holding on to the horns of the temple. So the guy came back. He said, David, he's in the temple. He said, he won't leave. He said, well, you go in there and kill him right in there. He took care of business. And and what it said to me is exactly what we're going to read about down in verse 12, that there's a settling of accounts that takes place at the end of it all. God has the last word. And in verse 8, it says, And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Babylon is fallen. The fall is described 
in detail in chapters 17 through 18. So we'll wait to get into talking about what Babylon is. Now concerning those who worship the beast in verse 9. Then a third angel, so you see a lot of angelic activity going on here. Then a third angel followed them, the other angels, saying, and again with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, here's what's going to happen. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. That's a reality. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. No getting out of it. And they have no rest day or night. Can you imagine? Like, did you not sleep well maybe one night this week? Or last Sun Saturday night, I did not get to sleep till 4 a.m. in the morning. I just couldn't believe it. I got up in the morning, and I was trying to make my coffee, and the button wouldn't go on, so I, I kept plugging it in here or there. And I thought, it must be broken. So then I got another coffee maker, plugged it in. It wasn't working. And I thought, what is going on? I can't even talk, see? Well, then I figured I, was, I wasn't pushing the starter button. I was pushing the, the other button. I thought, oh, man, I'm in trouble. And what does that have to do with, oh, yeah, it has to do with no rest day or night. You know how miserable it is when you don't sleep well? We all know what that is like, don't we? Well, what if you just went on and on and on and on and never, ever, ever, ever slept well? What if you had no rest day or night forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever? Those who, in verse 11 in the middle, who worship the beast, his image is repeated, and whoever receives the mark in his name. And here is the patience of the saints, which we referred to earlier, and I mentioned with King David. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. What happens is saints will be able to endure knowing that God will punish their enemies. There's a certain strength that comes into your life. When you read the Psalms, if you've got enemies, you read the Psalms. If you happen to be upright and they are not, when you read the Psalms, you know God's going to take care of those people. They're not going to get away with it. And you find a certain comfort in it. You don't wish destruction on them most of the time. But in your right mind, you realize God is going to take care of them. And during the tribulation period, here's the patience. And the word patience means being able to hang in there when literally all hell is broken loose on earth. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. And then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord as Christians from now on, yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. What a blessing for these people who die, the Christians, who become Christians during the tribulation and they die. What's going to happen to them is they're going to be blessed because they're going to rest from all their labors, no more work. And their works, their good works, will follow them right on into heaven, and God will reward them for their good works. Do you know that there will be different degrees of honor during our place and time with God at the end of it all? We're all going to be with God. We're all going to go to heaven. But depending on how you have lived your life as a Christian, you will be rewarded according, accordingly. There will be different degrees of glory, if you want to call it that. 
There will be no more crying, but he will delegate certain things to certain people in light of what they've done. So, you know, we all think of the preachers. They're in front of everybody, Billy Graham and blah, blah, blah. Well, he's probably got as many rewards now as he ever needs. But, you know, the, the obscure person who nobody knows who is serving God so carefully and precisely and humbly and consistently and goes through this and goes through that, how do we know that they won't have a much greater place of glory in heaven than the preacher who was in front of everybody? God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Interesting to think about. Verse 14 deals with the harvest of judgment. And I looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man. And you will remember from John, I believe it's chapter 5, where Jesus said, all judgment has been given to me. It's John 4 or 5. He is the Savior now, but he's going to be the judge. All judgment has been given to him. He's sitting uh, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle, which some of us have maybe never seen or we saw when we were children. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Seems odd, but he's now speaking to Jesus. Thrust in your cycle, your sickle and reap for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. You know, if you study in the New Testament a lot about the harvest is great, contextually with this part of Revelation, it doesn't always mean the salvation of souls. It can mean the harvest of the unsaved. The tares and the wheat will be separated. And God will, and that's why the Lord says, don't worry about separating the wheat and the tares. God will take care of that. And here he's telling him, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he sat on the cloud, thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle, and another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So that shows you that this harvesting is a harvest of judgment. And the winepress, we've all seen people walking around barefooted, stomping on the grapes of the wine that I hope you don't really drink too much of. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs, apparently a reference to Armageddon, which we will see in chapters 16 and 19, when the blood from the slaughter will flow 200 miles to the depth of about four and a half feet. The great judgment of God. It's coming. In chapter 15 is really a prelude to the final judgments of God. And uh, you can take a peek at those as you want to. And um, you know, One of the things we can pray for this evening is just as we're worshiping and in our final song of worship, and I think there's a couple of announcements here, is to ask the Lord to take our lives and to help us by filling us with the Holy Spirit of God. 
overflowing. I mean, if you took a bottle that was half empty, that's, you know, you got some water. But just imagine if it was overflowing, you'd say, man, <laughs> this has got some lot in it. God wants to flow out of our lives.